Currently, Sports Direct's culture is focused on hierarchy, financial performance and efficiency, with a lack of focus on employees and other stakeholders. You could argue that their current culture is causing issues in their warehouse, which is then influencing other areas of the business, such as its reputation and financial performance. Therefore, Sports Direct should aim to change its culture to become more ethical and reduce its hierarchical structure. Alverson argues that a lot of culture changes focus on large technocratic change, which are grand schemes to influence culture. However, these approaches can often be unsuccessful, particularly in large organisations such as Sports Direct. Instead, Sports Direct could focus on an informal and incremental long-term project for change. This would involve modifying culture through the everyday reframing of meanings and values. This approach is based on the work of Alverson in 2012. The idea is that as people in the business influence others, that these who have been influenced then influence more people. The idea is similar to Lewin and Regine's metaphor of a raindrop falling on a lake as the ripple replicates itself and spreads, similarly to how the change would spread in Sports Direct. So how would this take place? But initially, a team would be put together in order to work as influencers within the organisation. This should include Mike Ashley and a few other senior leaders, but mostly include middle managers within the warehouse as this is where a lot of the cultural change will need to happen. This shouldn't be broadcasted as a formal change process as it is not and they're not following a set plan. The team should undergo training from consultants to understand how to read values and meanings within an organisation. The team should then go away and work as normal for a number of months, with a heightened awareness of the culture in the organisation and how people currently act and interact. This information could be fed back to the wider team and be shared among themselves. The organisation should then consider the meaning of the culture changes they want to achieve and what it would actually look like for the organisation. The change team should then take part in a number of workshops. First, this would include how to su subtly influence people through everyday conversations and work. And secondly, they would have to take part in workshops in creativity, as it is key that managers are able to influence people they work with in a creative manner. So how could this actually be implemented into an organisation? Well, with this type of culture change, it's hard to implement exactly what the members of the team could do to influence people, as it's focused on influencing culture in everyday events. And clearly, we cannot predict what will happen on a day-to-day -day basis. Although we, I have written down some ideas. So in terms of middle managers within the warehouse, to try and reduce um, the rigid hierarchy, managers could let team members decide how to approach tasks. And if employees ask how tasks should be done, then the managers should comment that however they see best is okay. Managers could ask for workers' help on solving a problem they are dealing with, ask them what they would recommend, and then let them solve it themselves using their own ideas. They could also ask employees to take um, any meetings that may be happening within the team, with the manager stepping back. And to try and improve the way that employees are treated, if a manager sees a practice that is unethical, then they could question it and ask the employee if there is an alternative way to work that is more ethical. They could also make sure that when holding conversations with employees, that they are generally respectful and caring towards these employees. Now in terms of senior managers, to try and reduce the rigid hierarchy, if they wanted to find out information um, about the warehouse or something from the warehouse, they could look past the warehouse managers and go straight to the normal workers to speak to them instead. They could also encourage more junior people to come along to senior meetings, let them share their ideas and engage in discussion with them. And to try and improve the way that employees are treated, in everyday strategic conversations they can make sure to bring in consideration of ethics and the wider stakeholder opinion on these decisions. Also, if any ethical issues arise within the business, they can make sure they aim to solve it as quickly as possible to demonstrate the importance of the issue to them. Now, in terms of the role of the consultant within this type of change, clearly the consultant cannot do this job for Sports Direct, and the consultant's role would be in a facilitating role. We would provide training for managers to develop their skills to act on this approach and hold regular brainstorming sessions to discuss techniques and approaches we have used and what has been working for others within the group. Now to evaluate, this is an open-ended and long-term approach and the results may not be seen immediately. In order to judge success, the initial influencing team should observe what is going on in the organisation and determine whether their attempts to influence are working. There are some clear limitations to this type of change though. So Alverson argues that this type of change is not from a position of power or authority. It's made as please shareholders as clearly they want results and change quickly within the organisation and may not be patient enough to wait. Therefore, before this happens, there may have to be a few initial policy changes to appease the shareholders, such as removing zero-hour contracts. Also, managers must be very skilled to implement this type of change, and even with training, would they actually be able to do it? Especially with sports directors, their managers don't seem to be particularly professional. 
There could also be some resistance from middle managers in the influencing team, who it almost seems like they're giving up a bit of power to allow a reduction of hierarchy within the organisation. This could be defined by Cotter and Schleisinger in 1979 as a parochial self-interest, where employees feel that they will lose something of value as a result of the change, and tend not to focus on the best interests of the organisation. They argue that a way to solve this type of resistance is through education, so by explaining to the managers that they are not losing power, but instead lose using it in another way may help to resolve this.